Murdo settled his elbows on his knees and pulled up the hood on his jacket, although it wasn't cold. It was calm and peaceful. He noticed the breeze, that wee whoosh, whoosh. That is how calm it was, just sitting there on the bench. That was good anyway, having benches. It was too wee a place for a waiting room, but at least you could sit down. Then leaning forwards, your elbows on your knees, just staring at the ground. And the ground was like anywhere in the world, you could forget everything. What happens when you get mesmerised? The way sounds connect in your brain. You hear sounds. Him and Dad on a bench and nobody walking past. A ghost town. People in their houses and all the doors closed. Windows all shut, yet sounds were here. The wind at night blows in from the hills or from the sea. Thunder miles away in the sounds. What comes in your ears? These wee passages and tubes. Something does. Then what happens? Connections, memories maybe. Not just memories. You go someplace in your brain. Back home they lived up a hill at the back of the town and there were no sounds except country sounds. The fields and the hills, the forest, the river and the lochs, the sea itself. Lying in bed at night and you cannot sleep and you have to close the window. How come? Oh, it's too noisy. But the sounds aren't loud. It's only because you hear them. You, you hear them. So you just have to not hear them. Then you can go to sleep instead of floating in your bed. A science teacher played the class music to do with rain and water. Big dollops of rain on a corrugated roof. Soft pattering on a shallow pond. A rushing river. Drip trails and a pane of glass. People were impressed. But it wasn't as big a deal as all that. The fiddle makes the sound of a train blowing in from a distance, disappearing into nothing. A mouth organ did as good a train sound as a fiddle. Trains coming and going. You could do stuff in accordion too, or plucking a guitar string. It depended who was doing it and what they were doing it for. But it was always people doing it. Take away the people and there wasn't anything. That included computerised sound systems, multi-track mixing and whatever, it was still you had to program it in. The teacher was right about that. Thank you very much. Cameron. Okay. Um, I guess I'd like to begin by asking how much importance you place on performing your work. And performing? Uh, well, I think if you're doing a reading, for me, the writer should do a performance of it. If I was organised, I would hope that the writer would do a proper reading. But not all readers can do it, really, because often their, their work doesn't stand up to that test. It has to be... Uh, it has to have the same re uh, kind of type of or formal qualities that you, 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 you always assume is the case in poetry and I like to assume is the case in prose too but it isn't always and for some writers they haven't quite worked out that things in prose should be as tight as they are in poetry but if you have writers who who know and who have that formal interest uh, and whose work you can trust then they, sh they should do a performance by performance, all I mean is you're telling a story and you you have to go with it, and, you know. So I, I'm I'm in favour of that. There's not enough of it now, really, because of the the way that the uh, most literary festivals, for example, are basically book festivals. You know, so the thing is to do with books. It doesn't matter who has written the book, Franz Kafka, or you know. Uh, Simon Cowell but what's important is the idea of the book uh, and generally that applies even uh, in this situation where people are sitting down chatting together so you would have like uh, Franz Kafka and Simon Cowell together 
and then you would be talking about the, uh, what they share in common, which is they've written books. <laughs> and uh, so obviously there's nothing they can talk about uh, apart from like, uh, do you use Tipex or, or do you have pencils or uh, how was your hotel? Do you stay close by the venue? Or They can't actually discuss the work and it would be the same uh, to have a, a reading or a performance. You can't have that with those writers. Uh, I mean, for well, Kafka was a very well kind of known as a, a great reader of his work, uh, you know, and in fact, he used to do that quite regularly. And he would perform other people's work, you know, like uh, Shalom Aleichem and some of the great Yiddish writers about time, Peretz and people. So, people would, Kafka was a guy that did the readings, you know, and did the performances. But then his work, of course, like other uh, great writers, will always stand that. Writers like Beckett or Joyce, or, uh, well, their, their work will, will stand performance because of how tight the phrasing is, how precise the syntax operates, and everything is operating towards grammar. Uh, the grammar towards drama, you know. When you talk about performance, really, you're talking about uh, where the best prose went from about 1840 for a hundred years, you know. That's what it was moving to us, was the the drama, you know. Uh, anyway, long answer as usual. <laughs> um, what, what is it that grammar because you're, you seem to have a very unique language and you sh shun standard of written English generally, uh, which has very sort of tight grammar rules and you're saying in order to give a good performance you have to have your own tight grammar rules. Who, who decides on what is your overall and your, what, your, what is good about it? these particular rules as opposed to the most of the world. In terms of grammar? Yeah. You know, f for me it really, there isn't, there isn't any one grammar in the sense, I mean, the, the grammar has to operate in terms of uh, clar clarification really, so that your story or your, your text is clear and there's no ambiguity unless, it, unless it's intentional. Everything has to work in a very precise way. And that to me is how grammar should operate. So there aren't any rules in that sense except those rules which are the most general rules, which is clarification. And to be, you know, and as, as, precise, as precise as is necessary. So we break every rule in the book as far as uh, standard forms or standard grammatical, grammatical forms concerned. Because you have to. Uh, do a, a grammar that brings alive the language uh, of that is necessary for you to uh, do your work in. I mean, if you if you're doing if you come from Dundee or around here or wherever it is in Scotland, then you want you want to have a fluidity in language that allows you to create stories from within that community. So that means you have to break these rules that have been imposed by a different, by a standardization. You know, because if you stay by their rules, then you will not be able to, uh, you will not get that authenticity. Uh, you will not get that uh, expression. You can't, you, you will, that will not happen. So you, you really have to uh, fight your way through kind of the imposition of any rules or, or to impose structures or and in a way maybe that's why writers uh, tend maybe to talk more about syntax and phrasing than they would about grammar but, uh, and in the way I, I don't I mean poets might talk about the unit the line unit or the, the unit of breath or something you know but so in a, in a way uh, prose at the level that myself and other writers work at you're more involved with that you know, you're involved with the uh, breath. You know, how long is that line? So some of my some of my sentences may not have a comma. And really, they're meant to be. Uh, if I was reading it, then I would read it without a breath pause. 
that's that's how it should be. And you can see that you'll see that in writers like uh, I mean the the great the American uh, critic poet writer Charles Olson that does uh, quite a lot of work on that has written stuff on that. But you don't have to go go there. Uh, Obviously, you would think of Beckett. That's who you would think of Beckett, and you would think of uh, Joyce, obviously. But if you go to somebody like Charles Dickens, you'll get it. Dickens, you know, Dickens is uh, can be really formal, very exciting. You'll read. Uh, sometimes you will find the way he uses uh, the conjunction, and you know, just the way he uses and and the occasional comma. And you'll find that uh, you'll find yourself reading fast or slow, or, and you'll realise, in fact, that that's that's a direction. This writer's directing you to read it that way, you know, and and you can't do that unless you you your grammar is a function of, of what your the necessity of what it is you're doing, you know. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. Your book festival that you mentioned earlier, where you have Kafka next to Simon Cowell, obviously, because it's things that are completely different. So, do you think there's a distinction between high art and low art that that distinction could ever be made? You, you know, my intuitively, I would say that I don't at all. But uh, if you gave me an example. Uh, it's a book written by Kafka and a sort of autobiography written by Simon Cowell or, or some or sort of genre. No, fiction. I don't really uh, see them as being the same thing. I think it's. I don't think you do any favors to to people like Simon Cowell and others uh, by by saying it's the same thing. I don't. I think it. I don't think it's fair. I mean, if if somebody if if a footballer or someone has has written a I produced a, an autobiography. It's, I think it's up to the organizer of festivals to, to say, look, we don't want to humiliate this guy, but put them in a the chair with these writers who spend every waking moment uh, involved in literature. It's just really, I think what you, you end up doing is finding that you, you should be bold enough to say that this is art and that is art, but it depends on uh, how we define art at that point. Could you I know, comment? That take, oh, sorry. Sorry, that yeah. actually takes you into things like genre fiction. Mm. Yeah. You know, so when, when when you're involved in genre fiction, I, I think uh, part part of the problem is that you have you have to kind of ignore. Yeah, you, ha you have to ignore the, the points. That, that bring value. You have to ignore what is it that, how do we define literary value or merit in literature? And in order to kind of judge or rather look at genre fiction, you find you have to ignore a lot of that because in genre fiction you don't get it. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just not there. Uh, so So I don't even know whether it's not. I mean, high high art, low art. I think that that becomes maybe a critical language that I I, I kind of feel that I've all, always felt that uh, artists uh, use a different language from critics, and I don't know whether artists really would talk about some areas of genre fiction as being art. I don't know whether uh, genre artists would be offended by that, or genre writers rather, but I don't, it doesn't really uh, have anything to do, in a way to do with me. Can you I know, ask, uh, a way, as a way of helping to clarify the question, which I think is a really interesting one, um, and very pertinent to a, you know, a student of writing, finding his or her place in the you know, structure, which is hierarchical, <coughs> suggested by the question itself. High art is here, low art is down there. But is there a role for the idea of a certain kind of art that is predicated upon this concept of rigour that you spoke about, having 
an intellectual role, a job to do, to educate people away from that other kind of literature that's more simple and generic? I don't, I don't think, I don't see it like that at all. That, that right away cuts across something for me that is, I think the writer, the writer's work or job is to do, is to write a thing properly. And what readerships are about is another area, and it's not it's not anything to do with the writer at all. I don't know. My only thing is to to finish a novel properly or do the do the work properly. The education process has got nothing. If I was organising the education process, I would I, the, it would be a, a structural thing. I would alter the whole thing. I wouldn't just. Uh, uh, no, I don't. To me, it doesn't work in that way. And I would go to my own kind of boyhood and what I was reading in my teens and uh, I, I would see right away from that that you you, would, you have to approach that whole area of hoping to teach through education or through literature there are there are different ways you can do it you don't have to go through you know people have to read the uh, uh, I mean we all uh, well my generation we, we would all read everybody would read Enid Blyton there's no such there would be no such thing as a as a, a young a toddler is not reading Ian Blyton mm -hmm. of my generation you know like uh, 60s 70s and so on but that that doesn't have to be a natural educative process that, that we, we would want to generalize and build build on uh, and part of that would be like well you bring young people through this that then they, they read westerns and then they move on to detective fiction and sure. science fiction I really don't go for that at yeah. all I, I think uh, write, writers, may, uh, readers, when you're young, you, it depends on what you have access to, where your own interests lie, and you can make extraordinary leaps. So, uh, as I say, I, I know that from my own, as a teenager, mm -hmm. I know what interested me when I was maybe 12, 13, 14. Uh, I know that, uh, as I mentioned somewhere before, my mother, because of the, the trial of D.H. Lawrence, I, I know I was reading Lady Chatterley when I was 15, mm. uh, and I still hadn't left school. I had just turned 15, uh, maybe I was 14. And I, I just bought it because of the sex. You know, I was a, a paper boy. Yeah. So I just saw the, in the newspapers about all the, the controversy about sex. So I, I went away and bought it. And my mother found it because she was a real reader and burnt it, <laughs> which uh, for me was like, what are you burning my book for? I just paid for it one dough. I'm a paper boy. Uh, I was like, <laughs> it's the same if I was smoking quite heavy, you don't stop me smoking. That's why I'm working as a paper boy. I'm just like, it's your money, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the same, but I know that I was I was reading, and when I was reading kind of uh, things you would associate being 15 westerns, for example, I know that I was reading kind of uh, westerns that, are always like, like Louis Lamour and people who are regarded as better. Or I was reading early work by Harold Robbins, who was doing kind of quite good work before he became very commercial, you know. And then I was very quickly, because I liked art, uh, I was very quickly reading artist biographies, you know, as I, again, as I mentioned somewhere else. Uh, for me, it was life of artists. It was always exciting, you know. Again, because it was like a good, they had a good nightlife. I wasn't really interested in the life of the saints, you know. You're just like an ordinary teenage boy. I mean, for God's sake, you know. I would rather read about Madio Yanni, you know, work way, work his way through nightclubs in Paris, you know, yeah. painting lassies in the nude. I mean, why do you want to go and? <laughs> but what happens there when you're involved uh, is that. Uh, I was also, I kind of liked the painting as well, you know. But what I'm saying is that you, you, you go somewhere else. That led me into, I just became really into reading biographies of artists, you know, so mm. people like Suzanne and so on would, would interest me more and read about him and read about his relationship with Zola. And so I would start reading people like that when I would be 16, 17, 18. So you're coming, you don't have to go through this. I think it's a mistake to see a homogeneity yeah. in that sense, you know. And I think when, uh, as a writer, you you know, or rather as a reader, a reader who's discovering, then you will move in all different ways. And you, you, you don't just come through literature in order to, you know, 
Uh, well, it's literature in its broadest sense, I would say. Is that around the areas that yeah. you're, so, you're thinking of? Yes. Can I ask a question? I mean, I'm not supposed to do this because I'm a camera person. I wasn't supposed but, to do it either. But it's just to do with the cadence of the sentence, which is which is what Cam started off with, which was so interesting. Performance and cadence. And also because I've seen that letter that you, you know, that little piece in the La Rose um, um, tribute, um, in which you talk about Selvin and and Selvin's great innovation was actually to use a kind of Trinidad, Trinidad and Patois, which was in some ways invented, in some ways stylized, and in some ways also vernacularly real, so called. Um, and then you refer to other language um, writers like Amos Tutola, um, and all of these particular writers have a real facility for speech, and the writing is infected by speech. Yeah, and I just wondered whether that was a, another way to t- to to think about that high low dimension, because of course writing is always privilege over speech and has been traditionally for quite a long time. Yeah, and I just so for me that post war generation was so interesting because they started to overturn yeah. that that privilege of writing over speech. Well, you, you know. What I was speaking about earlier, in a way, is part of that to do with grammar. And although I only kept it within Scotland, I mean, obviously, it's simply because I didn't want to go into talking about post imperialism. Uh, I was wanting to keep it involved with. Uh, I don't mind going anywhere as far as that that area is concerned in terms of. But it's uh, there in Tom Lennett's work because, as well. Because sorry, it's there in Tom Lennett's work. This whole idea of the Scots idiom. And again, speech and what counts as poetry. Yeah, I mean, to, yeah. Well, obviously, yeah, Tom, uh, Tom and myself obviously have been. Tom's a poet, and I'm a prose writer, and we've been friends since we were young writers. Uh, but there are other ways of, of go, yeah. going in this. You know, okay. I mean, I can go on it from uh, in terms of uh, Scottish uh, literary tradition. And you know, or I can talk about it in the way that my own exploration as as a young writer, uh, there's that you know because they they aren't the same. Simply because I didn't know about the Scottish literature until I was a bit older. I left school at fifteen, so I had no higher education at that time. All I wanted to do was find a way to tell the stories I wanted to to write. So, and I was used to reading up from other cultures. I didn't read English literature as such since I'd been a kid. I had no interest for me, uh, simply because of the class and the elitism that you 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 constantly bump your head against, racism and all of that. As English literature is just absolutely full of that. And it's as if nobody notices it. No one, no one often does notice it, you know. It's, and it's, but if you're at the receiving end of it, it's really quite, it's quite shocking, you know. And whether that's Kingsley Amos or whether it's Evelyn Waugh or T. S. Eliot, but if the elitism of these writers, the racism, the I mean, it's really shocking. The class bias and the prejudice. So for me, I, I just kind of, why would I want to read, read that, you know, when they're, they're basically saying that your people aren't capable of, of reading a book, never mind writing a book, you know, it's just, uh, so for me, I kind of left all that behind, and my interest right, right away, I, when I was reading the artists, that's one reason why that would interest me, to read biographies of artists, because you were not involved in all that crap. You know, so that would take me into the writing that I read was all uh, the European or uh, not African at that time, but it would be the Russian writers and German, French, Italian, uh, and then and also some of the American realists. Quickly, you quickly move from reading the kind of uh, the better type of maybe Western writers. I mentioned Louis Lemur. It's a short jump from Louis Lemur to go to people like Jack Kerouac, believe it or not. It's not, it's not, 
and and in the in, uh, in the period in between that you have like Mark Twain and uh, uh, Hawthorne, uh, maybe not Melville until later, but you have a lot of great short story writers, Bret Hart, uh, and then you have slightly up from that I would read uh, Kate Porter and Willa Cather, some of the great women American, the, the women were, are very strong in American literature. So they're the people that I would be reading, you know, uh, by, between those American, of that American realist tradition I'm talking about, you know, like the late 19th century from, uh, or rather, well, some earlier, you know, some mid-century like to Hawthorne and people, uh, and then, then Poe and, and uh, you know, so it took a while for me to come back into uh, English literature, and and include I say British literature. It took a while for me to uh, come come back and even look at that <laughs> because I, my own assumptions about what it was. In fact, I might even have been published before, because I was published when I was twenty five or twenty six. I had a book out when I was twenty six, uh, an old pub near the Angel. So, and I had that out before I met Tom Leonard, you know, I met Tom uh, about after that. So I'd already made my own explorations and phonetic transcription and so on, you know. But that was through looking at other cultures, you know. It, it was, that was certainly not any part of any tradition at that point. It was only because I needed to get the sound of the voice. You'd be far better to look at the influence at that point in, in terms of music you know, and what was going on in music, because that is the, the, the 60s and late 60s, you know. So you're better looking at uh, rock music and blues and so on, where mm -hmm. where you have the, the liberation of voice. Uh, and it's hard coming from outside the UK mm -hmm. to, to understand or to grasp how, uh, I mean, the, the depth of the elitism in the UK and how people are effectively silenced, you know, and still perhaps, yeah, uh, and and the, there is there's very few gains being made. Okay, one last small little <laughs> because I can't help myself because I, this theme is really interesting to me. Are you in some ways saying that your clarification of voice and cadence and the rhythms of speech in your writing came from outside and through the American writers to Later on, I know you've spoken no, about was, the African no, writers. What, no, basically what I'm saying was it, it's all right to do what it takes to do what, what, you, what you, you want, want to do. To do. Okay. And you just have to go ahead and do it. Yeah. And that's really what I, I was doing, you know. So we, in Scotland, we would be used to certain things. You know, here in Dundee, for example, I mean, there, there was, the, you had the Sunday Post uh, the cartoons uh, that were being uh, produced up here by Dudley D. Moore and so on. So he had a kind of cod, you might say, speaking voice done phonetically in cartoons. So, And comedians would make a fool of how we spoke, you know. So we were kind of used to seeing a, a, a trivialised kind of thing about it. So you could actually try and make use of that to find a way in which you could express what it was to be a human being in a language normally associated with being a clown, mm -hmm. you know. So, but it, it, you have, it was a, a struggle that I had taken on on my own and so had most writers who were doing that, so had Tom Leonard and so had other writers who have been doing the same because you're, you're not really in touch with each other when you're doing that. It's, it's only after uh, in fact, I did a reading with Tom here at this university about 40 years ago. And the reason was it was Anne Stevenson who was the writer in residence here, who was a really a well known American uh, poet. And, and she, in fact, introduced me to Tom. Huh. Uh, and, you know, she was, uh, she was partners with her and Philip Hobsbawm were wow. together for a while. I didn't know that. So, they they lived together for quite a while, mm -hmm. Anne and uh, Philip. So I, I knew them at that time from maybe the early 70s. So Anne lived in Glasgow for that period. And she was a friend of another friend of mine, another American writer, you know. But writers were involved on their own 
and it was only through you meet and somebody would say, oh, you must have read Tom's work, and I'd go, well, not even heard of it. How Ooh. interesting that an American brought you two together, and that explains well, a lot. Well, it was in a, but then that, that was quite a well-known pub in Glasgow. Right. Uh, that people, a lot of writers and artists used to go to. I went to because I lived up above it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, occasionally, they uh, worked behind the bar. But I was driving buses at that time. That's, that's a fascinating story. So it was only later on that I started to realise there was a tradition in Scottish mm. literature and a very kind of strong and valid tradition, very considered tradition. Uh, part of it, and that takes it away from... It take, it, it's a very interesting way that operates because there's a level with, with your question where we, you talk about anti-imperialist struggles and we can talk about situation uh, Southeast Asia, I know there's a really good kind of Singaporean writer, mm. couple of writers who are using English in this way that, mm. that you would associate with myself and others. So you get uh, also, and this is a major struggle in the subcontinent, uh, Russian people are down against it, but there's a lot of mm. Indian writers who would think of my work, you know, and how we, how we get the speaking voice and how we, we try to use the rhythms of our other languages. You know, as they do, as African writers like the Nigerian writers, you know, Sarawiwa and Chuchola and, and others, you know. So, but the thing with the Scottish tradition, that there is a slight difference there uh, because it also moves into the wider Scottish intellectual tradition of that 18th century period. You know, this is what I, this is the way I kind of see it. Well, not only myself, other people would. Uh, other people would see it that way, you know, like the George Davy, the Scottish philosopher George Davy. Uh, he makes a really telling comment about Burns. To see yourself as others see you, there's that that kind of famous line of Burns, but that's also to do with the uh, the nature of perceptions, the Scottish intellectual tradition, and, and part of what became the strength of it. Uh, and you can see that the Burns was aware of that, and that again is part to do with like a, like uh, the moral uh, moral obligations or how how the strength of empathy. Uh, empathy is, is so important in that Scottish uh, intellectual or that philosophical uh, tradition there, you know, like from Francis Hutchison, the Scottish philosopher, uh, early part of eighteenth century and his kind of influence on others, including human people like that. But so the Scottish writers, in a way, cannot be divorced from their own time. Mm. And when writers like uh, like Burns and Ferguson and later, uh, not much later, say James Hogg, you know, that's part of our tradition. So, but I didn't know any of that because that's not taught. That That is actually... You don't get taught. When I went, eventually went as a, a, a young writer to university. None of that's taught. I felt as if I was from Mars, because they don't even, you, you know, like they, no one looks at, at it in that in that way. I don't know if it happens mm. nowadays, but that but in those days, you didn't even have a, a Scottish literature department. You just had maybe one room and the guy who specialised in Scottish the Scottish stuff, you know, and that is in Scottish. But that applied across, applied in Scottish philosophy as well, and you, know, you don't. It's not regarded. It's not treated with respect, really. And you, you really, and because of that, younger people cannot learn within a tradition. So all they can do is discover it in a piecemeal fashion, you know. And to some extent, it's not moved on a, a great deal from there, really. Well, I was going to ask, actually, sorry, Karen, then we must come back to your questions, but the way you described your own um, um, coming to you know, coming to your work in this intuitive way, kind of working in the dark, um, it, might that be a kind of way that all artists in the end live? I mean, it's quite an interesting question in this world of programmes and educational modules for everything, you know, how to be a writer, for example. Yeah. Um, whereas in actual fact, do we come to the theory of why we did it and how we did it after the event of the actual making? 
seems to be what you're suggesting. I didn't get the first part of what you were saying. Because I'm sitting on the wrong side. I know, that's why I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm turning on to you and trying. Well, don't worry, because I'm aware we're running out of time and I'm not supposed to be asking the questions anyway. I'll uh, ask this you is later. Good old ca Cameron yeah, here, Cameron, you know. Come back. He asks one question, he sets me going for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so he's going, oh God, I better not ask this again. It's too naive. It's not too naive. Go ahead. <laughs> They're all great questions, Cameron. I was just wondering if you think writing could can never be unpolitical. It's just politics will go into human nature and anything you write is a political story past the political nature. How the politics goes within it. Yeah. You, you know, one of the things about it is I, what I realised, or I came to realise, I was forced on me, was you could not help but be political because you were being political. To use language in the way I was, was causing stress to people. The first time I read my, my stories, people never came back in a, in, a in a creative writing workshop run by Philip Bobsbaum, who was uh, mm. quite a well-known uh, professor, a good professor. Uh, he, yeah, I'd mentioned earlier, Philip, now, he had seen my these stories. I, I gave him in about five stories at a writer's workshop while I was driving buses, you know. I could have given him a few, but I gave him those. I would be about 25 at that time. And I'd been writing since I was 21, writing seriously, you know. And there was a couple of people never came back to the, to the class after that, the, the writer's group. And the, they said that they had been, basically they were shocked by my stories, you know, that they should go there and hear the language of the gutter, that was the uh, phrase. That response has been the response to my work all the way through. Now, as soon as that happens when you're a young writer, and the next, the first publication, the, the printer refused to print, as I mentioned in, in an essay, and that was a University of York. Uh, I'd, I'd met somebody at, Philip Hogsbaum's class, who was a postgrad student at York, he said, we would want to publish one of your stories in our student's magazine, you know. So I gave him a couple of stories to choose from. They chose a story and put it in, but the, the printer refused to print it. So the, stu the students were very kind of embarrassed by it. And, uh, and anyway, and that was the first story. So, 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 so that would be, when would that have been? That is 1972 or 70, 1971. So I would still have been 25 at that time. Because that happens to you, you're, you're forced in a way to say, guys, I thought I was doing the best I, I could do here. Because <laughs> that's really what you do as a young artist. You just do your best. And you try to find a way that you're just kind of, you're, you're doing the best you can to express what it is you want you express within your story or your song or your painting. And that's what I had done. So when people take that reaction to it, and you and you, you cause real, causing real upset to people, you're going, hang hey, hey, on a second. But it forces you to go, right, what, what is it that's wrong here? Because for, for me, again, I, I've come from traditions that are not the English, standard English literary form of that type of assimilated Scottishness that that I could not cope, would, would not cope with reading, whether it was Edwin Muir or any of those, that type of stuff for me would be, I'm not saying it's, it's invalid, but I don't want, I cannot be involved in it. This is my story, so right, that would have been my position at that time. No, it's great, and you, you all can go on with that, but I'll just stick with Dostoevsky and Kerouac or whoever the hell it is, Camus, or not because I'm saying they're better, but because they're the ones that interest me as, as, a, as a young writer, you know. And, I'll, and I'm only taking the same freedoms that I can see that they take, you know. You, you know, you can see the freedoms they're taking in their work, and that's all you... So you, you just assume you're right to, to do that, you know. And so when you look through what is it you're doing, oh, I use the word fuck 
well, it wasn't me really, it was a character, it was the old guy. Maybe they thought it was me that said fuck off, whereas it was the character of my story, which I, I still get all, all the time. You know, people still say, why are you swearing all the time? You go, well, I'm not swearing all the time at all. It's like, don't you realise it's a character of a story? You know, oh, yeah, you know, you, you did, you're swearing all the time. <laughs> Yeah. So, in, in other cultures don't have that. You go, why is this still an issue here? Uh, or, you know, if my character's an atheist, then if he says, for God's sake, he's not going to have a capital G for God. So why, you know, I was being accused of, like, uh, whatever, uh, whether it was anti-religious or something, you know. <laughs> I mean, how can I put in a capital G or or capital J for Jesus, he's an atheist, you know, if he's going to, it's up to him what he does, if he wants to become a Christian in order for, my, for me to write a story about him, but then he's a fictitious <laughs> character, you know, has he got to suddenly become a Christian before you print the story? <laughs> I don't know, you know, maybe I should go to a different culture, well, unfortunately you can't do that. But it's, it's, a, it's a difficult situation, but, but what you end up with is that the actual, the search for honesty as an artist is, is a political act. And the political act in terms of the visual arts, uh, you can see it in quite clear, I mean, it goes across the board. One of the reasons why genre fiction doesn't always stand up is because stereotype there's a kind of there's almost like stereotypical things that are used devices so-called devices in a sense it's like anti-art because in, in art unless there's a, a very good reason for it then every single human being in that painting even if it's lowry every single shape and so on should be an individual human being that's being there is no stereotype uh, there is no cliche human being there every single human being has a unique life you know but that assertion becomes a very political thing and, and, my, and the, the, my work and work of other people that that becomes like we don't want to hear about these people what people these are stories i'm writing you know, well, we just don't want you go and do your story somewhere else. We want stories about nice detectives in Edinburgh who clean yeah. up the town, yeah. or nice detectives in Glasgow, you know, who kind of listen to rock music, or you know. But we we don't want to hear about uh, like the guy who's in the gutter, you know, unless uh, somebody can, you know. There's all that type of uh, keep the language in the gutter for the people in the gutter and let them stay in the gutter, you know. Uh, that that type of uh, and it's not as though you do it that you write that way in order to irritate people. It's simply because if you're going to be an artist at all, well, you wouldn't go into being an artist if you, you felt I, have to, I can only go in there and be a third rate artist. Well, you would, uh, maybe you would look for another job. You know, why would you go in? Yeah. I would mean, be a third rate artist. You know, well, in our society, you can only be third rate. In literature, to some extent, it still is that way, you know. <laughs> and here I'm at 70 and I've been doing it for 45 years, you know, or nearly 50 years. But it's not really moved on that much, to be honest about it. I'm not that soon. You know, there's still... Certainly not within the... There's still the marginalisation mm -hmm. uh, of, of decent work. There is still the, the kind of uh, people are lauded to, you know, who, who say things that you think... I mean, I, I was I read there was a, a big spread in the Guardian about a week or so ago about Alan Bennett, you know, mm -hmm. and Alan Bennett who's, who's always this kind of oh this is this nice guy, mm. you know, and you come, and you're reading through and you think he's like the middle class's answer to Alf Garner, really, <laughs> and he comes out he comes out with this uh, like uh, in one of his diary uh, extracts. And, he's, and he dismisses this human being as some Scottish woman. Some Scottish woman came out and said, mm. and you think, now see that kind of, a, a, that type of racism. Casual. Which is what it is. Yeah. That casual racism mm. that is allowed 
down south. Yeah. And it's a little bit there. It's always been there. I mean, that's the kind of thing that I would say uh, uh, you get with Ian Evelyn Waugh's third party narrative. This is why, you know, in order to do what I do as a writer, you have to subvert the third party. First person's too easy. So you, you, you have to find a way into third party. Uh, and third party, simply because, you know, to use the that shorthand academic way, the, the so-called God voice, in other words, it's supposed to be an objective. The third party is supposed to be a statement of the facts. It's supposed to be like the equivalent of literary logic. There is no value. It's not a value-laden text. It's just like uh, value-free. That's 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 always the kind of assumption or the presumption you might say about a uh, third party narrative in, uh, in a standard English text. You know, and what happens is you you see those so-called God voice, and it's maybe. Somebody like Evelyn Warren, you, I remember the, the one that I referred to before, it's in that one where his character, I think it's a handful of dust. I had to study it at uni and I had a fight about it. But within the, the, stand, the, the, the God voice or the, the uh, objective narrative, there's this black guy who gets on who's a, a preacher and in the, in the third party, the it says, he laid his paw on the table. Mm-hmm. And this is a third, this is, you know, so I had to say to the, the tutor, you know, we'll have to find some way to say, why should I have to read the work of a fascist or a racist and not be able to refer mm-hmm. to that fact? We have to play this game that he's a great English writer. What, what's going on, you know? When, uh, you can't take something as basic as that, you know, to show this. Well, we, I don't think he's racist. Well, what is that? This is a third part. Either either he's racist or he's the most inefficient writer going. Yeah. There's no in between here, <laughs> you know. And there are no and, borders to this kind of writing because Alexander McCall Smith is exactly the same. Yeah. But they do, but that's there in the text, you know. Like if you're going, going to, all you want them to say is, okay, he's racist. So, and the elitism, say, of T.S. Eliot in the quartets, I had to study that in my honours year or something. And you're going, look, I don't mind studying T.S. Eliot and doing, but this is extraordinary elitism here. You know, I mean, are we allowed to talk about how can, if he is such a great artist, how can a great artist be so elitist? Because he's dismissed an entire like seventy percent of the population has been dismissed. They don't even have any unique individual experience as human beings because there it's all defined in a stereotypical way. You know, I, I don't mind studying them if if that's admitted. But why are we all having this pretense that these are totemic figures that we, you know, uh, oh, we should all aspire to? Let me get to the states. <laughs> let <laughs> let me get to somewhere else away from this, you know. <laughs> mm. But and so that kind of thing. The what you realise is that you, as a if if you're really doing your work as an artist, you don't have to in any way try and be political. You cannot not not be political. As if you pursue your work honestly, it will always be political, really. And that, that becomes a, a the kind of the easy type of a person or, or, or the smug kind of artist or people of bourgeoisie position, they might go, or, or well, I go along with Jim here because it means art for art's sake. Well, no, it's not art for art's sake at all. We're talking about something different here. But at the same time... Uh, for me, it was always an argument I would use to say that other writers and artists don't have to do what I, what I do or have done in the past, which is be involved in political campaigning. You don't have to be involved in that. I didn't have to be involved and don't think there was any need for me as an artist to be involved in that. Not every artist is capable of being involved in a campaign. These kind of discussions that you would have around the Caribbean artist movement, there is no necessity 
because uh, becoming involved in political work or campaigning work is to do with yourself as a human being in that way. It's not somehow, because you, you don't want artists to be elevated to this rarefied position that somehow they've got a greater moral obligation than the ordinary person. I don't I mean, that's just nonsense, you know. Mm. Uh, that again is quite elitist about uh, what you're saying about artists. So artists are up here and the rest of the world is, you know, yeah. you know, I, I really don't go along with that either. Have we got time for one more question from Cameron? Yeah. Do you, would you ever write from the point of view of a person, not from your own background or culture? Well, I have done that often. Well, from completely different. You know, you know, I, I do. I mean, well, you know, uh, I, I just, you know, if you take into account all my work. That you may only be thinking in terms of some novels, or I don't know. Well, <coughs> I don't know. Have you ever written from the perspective of someone not from Scotland? You, you know, I, I, well, there are all the novels, the short stories, and there are uh, there are plays. In the short stories, uh, there's different areas of experience that uh, I, I use and work, work from. You know. And translated accounts, it would be the obvious example of a novel that uh, doesn't have anything to do with my own background, or obviously a modern community, put it that way, better, you know, uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's not at all anything in, in a way that, that uh, refers to you know, Scotland or, or, or is involved in any way with Scotland. And uh, I don't know, you go through them. Well, I, I often wonder, Cameron, and, and do people ever say to people like Mark Damis or Ian McEwan, would you ever consider not writing about the English upper middle classes? But the, there is always that unspoken thing there, or a tacit kind of thing, the idea that somehow to work from within my community is this kind of stultifying, uh, limited perspective that I'm intuitively always kind of uh, opposed to you might say you know uh, because it goes it, it suggests really that, uh, there's a there, there are quite uh, undefined okay but there, there are these limits to to uh, I mean as my background does that include for example Plato it's always assumed that my background is well I don't know what it's what it's how other uh, guys from Glasgow. Well, I don't, see, I don't know if I if I put you on the rack here mm. and, and say, well, what what do you mean by that? What what does it mean to be somebody from my background? What does that mean? Well, what is, or rather, who is somebody from my background apart from me? You know, you go well. Here is my background. And it's just, it's an open book in a way, you know. Oh well, 15, left school, uh, started work, went to the States near 17, came back, worked at all these different jobs all over, uh, did all that. Started writing at 21, published at 25, and uh, married at 22, a couple of kids and driving buses, and you go through all that. And, uh, is that, is that a, I mean, every single person's life has all these extraordinary twists and turns. Besides which, I was thinking, well, when did I first uh, read such and such? I mean, working class people have access to books and read books. I mean, you know all that. But the problem is, once you kind of go into that, or, or try to kind of uh, examine the basis of that question. I'm not sure how far it takes you, really, because I think it takes you into a lot of uh, presumptions and prejudice, not not yours, but underlying it. It's like, wait a minute, what do I mean by that? I mean, that'd be a, a joke uh, for myself and, uh, well, not, not you and Tom, you know. Uh, 
our our backgrounds are were, were different, uh, both working class but uh, very different. My backgrounds are very much a readers kind of uh, a readers working class background, you know. But if I go, have you heard of Jeff Torrington, the writer Jeff Torrington? No, Jeff. Uh, uh, who, who wrote a, a smashing novel, Swing Hammer Swing, yeah. back in the yeah. uh, 1980s, Jeff. But Jeff and I would kind of have a laugh about that, talking that, uh, and John LaRose. I would talk about that with John LaRose and some of the people around John. See, like, uh, the pornography that a lot of the guys smuggle into the toilet in places like building sites is black penguins. So you're going in there and you're you're reading like Homer or something, mm -hmm. you no. Know, uh, you you read you read anything. If you're working on the buses, you'll meet somebody who reads philosophy, or someone who, uh, or oh, you're interested in maths. That guy over there's good at maths. He's good, you know. And you'll go over you talk to somebody who. Uh, there there's this wide, huge, wide ranging area intellectual area and uh, uh, diverse you know and that it's really important to kind of see that that's the case you know and not allow the <coughs> cultural assumptions or social assumptions about basically about class and things of the intellect you know uh, because that, that's really what that you get I get asked related questions such as why do you write about these people when they don't read books? Who's going to read your books? Who will read your books? What do you mean by that? Well you just if you write about working class people, who are you going to who's going to read your books? Why would, uh, <laughs> and all of that stuff is, is kind of under the surface there, you know. <laughs> I think that might be a really good note upon which to finish this film, that every single question brings with it a whole range of other important and pressing questions. And your work, Jim, makes us alive and alert to the need to ask those questions. So It's a, it's a good one, though, Carmel, isn't it? It's a very good one. Once you, once you kind of get and just take it apart, yeah. you know, and you go... <laughs> uh, you, then you think, did I really ask him that? <laughs> then, but then you go, okay, right, what was my question? Right, let me, if it was the old style grammar, you parse that sentence, boy. <laughs> oh, well, there's the, the subject of it, and there's the, the verb, and there's the adverb. Why did I use that adverb? Mm. And so on, you know. Of course, the terrific thing about your fiction is that the very syntax itself asks us to explore well, that very thing. But these things never get picked up. You see that there's a novel I made called A Chancer. A Chancer, that was based on my first novel, my second novel published. But in, but in that novel, there are no adverbs. The, the only adverb, there's only concrete. The, there couldn't be anything with a value on it unless it was said in dialogue. Because I tried to write a value-free novel. That never gets picked up. No, never. Kelman's managed to do a value-free novel. We must have been reading yeah. Zola. Yeah. I was actually reading Zola. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But a few years before I wrote it. But, <laughs> but and with, so not using adjectives or adverbs, you know, at the same time you go, well, I want, if any writer doesn't really want to use an adjective or an adverb unless they can't find a proper verb or noun. That's your job. Is you're always looking for the, the precise noun. Okay, I can't get I can't get it. I've lost it today. So I'll have to use a an adverb. I'll have to describe the verb in order to get the meaning. You know. But I, uh, for me, it was like uh, I couldn't use uh, believe it or not. There was the obvious one I used to always tell, would say to students when I was tutoring. You know, the obvious one would be the pretty girl walked into the room. You go right. If I was a, a lassie, I'd slap you right in the mouth. How do you define pretty? Well, yeah. and you go, that's the God voice. You know, this is English literature. How could you be a woman and read that? Yeah, yeah. No wonder so many women were, <laughs> were the first, like Gertrude Stein and all the great, the great women uh, existentialist tradition, I would say. Yeah. Simply because you go, look, everything you, you do is male value. Yeah. 
you know, uh, and, and there's also class, like whatever height you are, whatever height I am, I would go, uh, you know, and that's in an essay of mine as well, Cameron, where like, if I go into a pub two miles away from where I live, nobody will say a word, but if I get in maybe half a mile down the road from where I live, if I go in the bar, they might go, hey, big uh, because around this part of Glasgow, I'm a big guy, five foot nine, Whereas if I go two miles up road to Bears Den, the average height is maybe six foot four. But they're all fucking middle class bastards there, you know. <laughs> That's where I'm from. <laughs> well, you know that. So look at that. He's a big yeah, guy. Really is it. And he's a walking, a walking illustration, man. <laughs> oh, wonderful. But you know, that that, that is, is like so that whole funny. thing about value laden text. Yeah. You know? That kind of gets it right away. You mm. say, and it's an obvious because nobody would think that yeah. would be the case. You know? uh, the adjective anyway, yeah, comes yeah. freighted with judgment. Mm. Oh, <laughs> lovely. What a great talk. Thank you so much. That was Thank lovely. You.